The question about monasticism is actually very important to talk about. First of all, I think I'd want to say is really there's just one orthodox life. It would be very easy to kind of say, ah, oh, there's the married life and then there's monasticism, or there's the life in the parish and then there's life in the monastery, as if they're two different. The monks, they fast, but normal orthodox don't fast. This is not true. This is a misconception. There's only one life in the church. It's, it's the orthodox life and it's the ascetic life. When I use the word ascetic or ascetical, I mean it was a sports terms. It was about a workout. It was about from athletics. And the church saw that and said, that's exactly what our life is about. We're, we're coming together uh, to exercise and to grow and to do those things that are the right things and often may be difficult things, but the joy of doing those things brings us into greater and greater freedom. And the monastics were the ones who said, we just simply want to do that 100% of the time. So it's like all of us are called to play, let's see, I'm gonna use the sports uh, analogy, to play the game, to get out there on the court or on the field or how, whatever in the, in the wrestling match or whatever. But it's, it's the monastics who have said, well, we just wanna do that full time. We don't want to do anything else in this world. And so it's not about either or. It's about just where on that spectrum of living the ascetical life will we find ourselves. And so within the parish church or within the monasteries, it's not a different form of spirituality, but simply a matter of degree by which we enter into it. And uh, those of us who live in the world may exercise less those spiritual disciplines, but it's not two different uh, spiritualities. Also, I know, for example, in the Roman Catholic Church that they, there's a kind of a category of different orders of, of monasticism. There are those that are more academic and, and those who feed the poor and, and so forth. There are those that are more mystical or something like that. Again, that's not, this is foreign to orthodoxy. Because we wouldn't say there's, we wouldn't say like uh, mystical Christianity is a category of orthodoxy. We'd say all of orthodoxy is mystical because it has to do with entering into the mystery of who God is and how he became incarnate in this world and how we are to be joined in fellowship and in a, a common body with, with the God-man. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to live this life of mystery, this life of wonder, of joy, of the doxa. It's hard to put into words. Uh, if, if, if a person gets it, if they see it, if they have a sense of, yes, this world is full of, uh, as the Celtic Christians used to call, thin places where, where two different worlds come together and intersect each other. And we want to live in that place of prayer and of uh, communion, of, of a life, of a shared, a shared life. Uh, we call it like an ontological where we share the being. We share God's, in God's being through his energies and they transform us. Well, monasticism is simply say, we want to get there as quickly as we can. We're going to run, we're going to sprint to that. Just like in, in sports within the world, you have, you have uh, big heroes, athletic heroes, or in the music world, those who have made it to the very top. Uh, they give them their whole lives, you know, artists and athletes and so forth. They just give full attention, uh, those who make it uh, to the top. And uh, the rest of the world puts up their posters in their bedrooms or whatever. Well, in the church, we have the icons and they are our windows into this life of communion with God. And many of them are monastics because they're the ones that were the athletes that really went full blast. And just like in the world, it's, it's, an, anal it's an analogy between what uh, we value in the world. We value those who really give everything. So the, the monks, show us the path and every parish, every uh, person that lives um, outside of a monastery 
should know monks, should know, visit monasteries and experience what a, you know, a day or a week of what it's like to just live completely dedicated to God in every aspect of our life. Oftentimes people also ask about a marriage and monasticism. And uh, so let me just speak about marriage for a moment. Um, marriage is seen, family life, uh, the, the union between husband and wife and then the children, and uh, it's seen as a small church or even a little monastic life. Let's use the analogy of a church. It's, a, it's an extension of the church. And what St. Paul says is that the union of male and female in marriage, of man and woman in a marriage, is a great mystery, he says in Ephesians. He says, this is a mystery, and here we say it points to something greater, something even more uh, mysterious. Marriage itself is a mystery. How, do, how does a man and a woman uh, who are so different from each other um, find a life of union and of unity and of communion and of fellowship and of a common mind? Even though there are distinctions between the two and, the, and differences between male and female, how is that brought together? That itself is a mystery, but St. Paul says it points to yet a greater mystery which is the marriage, the mystical marriage of Christ and his bride between God and his church. Uh, the union of human beings created clay vessels with the uncreated God, that there is a desire for a marriage. Uh, this is a great mystery, St. Paul says. I often say, that from the beginning of Genesis to the last word of Revelation, it's all about a marriage. It's all about union of heaven and earth, of God and his people. From the creation of Adam and Eve and their call to a union that is to be an icon of God's desire for the bride, his church. So the scriptures begin with marriage and end with in the book of Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come Lord Jesus, come for the mystical marriage of God and of the lamb with his bride, uh, God and his church. This is what St. Paul says, that human marriage is meant to mirror or be an icon of, or to point towards Monks just simply say, we're going to bypass human marriage in order to go directly to this union between God and his people and to live in that mystical marriage now, to participate in that mystical supper of the wedding feast of the Lamb, to do that here on earth as it is in heaven. And so we who are uh, and I'm a married priest, we who are married and have uh, children and so forth, we see the monks as that's the, that's the direction, that's the place, that's the destiny that, that we're also going towards. So our marriages are moving towards that, as, as the Lord himself said, that uh, in heaven, uh, people are not given in marriage in the same way as on earth, uh, for procreation and so forth but rather are like the angels in heaven. That is to say, there's a different kind of, and a higher form of union and of uh, marriage that is a transcendent form of which this world points towards. And monasticism is moving towards that in a much more direct way. So these are some of the uh, things around uh, marriage and monasticism. Uh, those of us in, in parish churches need the monks, and the monks, of course, uh, are not some separate thing, that, uh, but rather they, they need us too. Well, how do they need us? Uh, well, to, first of all, they need human beings to come from the married families, you know, uh, single men and women uh, to live a celibate life in, in the monastery. So it's the parish churches that provide the very people 
for uh, monasteries, not to mention other forms of support, uh, financial and various ways of supporting monasteries. But we're one body, one, uh, one unit, one, one being, really, monks and laity, not two separate things. Okay, a great question on, on what is it like to live at a monastery? And I can at least speak about this to some degree, even though I'm not a monk, because I've spent hundreds of hours, really hundreds of days um, and weeks over the last 30 years visiting monasteries. And since I retired uh, almost three years ago, I spend much of my life up in this little canyon um, in northern New Mexico, Canyonas, where there is a monastery. Now I've visited monasteries all over the world and I've visited some of the most famous monasteries all over the world and have benefited. But I find that this little monastery in Canyonas, St. Michael the Archangel, uh, the Archangel Michael Monastery, men's monastery, for me is just heaven on earth. And so I can say what I experience when I go there is I experience the ascetical life because often there'll be fasting and, and there'll be, there are times of the year where it's a very strict fast and there's lots of prostrations and prayer services and so forth. Uh, they get up, uh, they're praying every day at 4 a.m. for the whole world. And so um, that means when I go for a 4 a.m. service, I get up usually around 3 a.m. Now, if I'm also serving there, if I've been asked to be the protos, the priest that is serving for the liturgy, uh, I need to go an hour earlier. So I get up at two in order to do, it's called the proscomedia service, the service of preparation of the gifts that comes before the service begins. It takes about an hour or so. You're fasting a little bit from sleep and maybe from certain foods. So there's this form of fasting, there's a form of prayer and we could say also the, the three things that Jesus said are the very medicines that we need for our souls. He doesn't say if you fast or if you pray or if you give alms, but when you do, when you fast, when you pray, when you give alms. Well, all of these things we do when we come to a monastery, we bring gifts for them uh, to support, we pray with them, and often we fast in various ways from sleep, uh, keeping vigil, for example. Every day their, their services in general are uh, vespers at night around five o'clock. And the vesper service, the evening service, of course, is the beginning of the new day. We always go from darkness into light. And so the services begin for the new day uh, that evening, then we sleep a little bit, and then we get up in the middle of the night because it's in the middle of the night that this border between heaven and earth gets very thin indeed and we are, can enter in a new realm. The midnight hours of prayer, the vigils, the, the long hours of standing in prayer in the, in the darkness, and then moving into, by the time we do the divine liturgy, it's starting to get light out and so forth. And it's a way of understanding cosmologically the whole nature of night and day, from darkness into, into light. And then they go about their work during the day. How they do that, how they sustain that is a miracle. And it's based on the amount of prayer that they, they have because they work all day long. And if you're visiting a monastery, well, maybe the first day or two or three, you're just there, rest, pray, take walks. But if you're gonna stay longer, then help during the day, chop wood, work in the kitchen, uh, dig uh, trenches for, I don't know, be out in their fields, their gardens, and uh, do those things that help uh, sustain the day. And, but for the monks, their work is also just another way to pray. So when they're working in their garden, they're praying. They're praying the Jesus prayer. You, it may be just in their hearts, or you may actually hear them sometimes out loud. Uh, chanting or, or just praying softly. But work, they see work in a way that the world does not understand work as a honor and gift, uh, as a form and a 
vehicle through which we can continue prayer. So work for monks is another form of prayer. And, um, and so their whole life is about prayer. And then at the meals, uh, oftentimes if you're at their meal, you just sit uh, in silence and one person would read spiritually uplifting literature of the fathers, of the saints. And so you're eating physical food but you're, you're also really eating of the spiritual food. I don't know how it's so, but, well, I, I do know how it's so. The food at the monastery is the best I've ever had. I've eaten the finest cuisine all over the world, but the food of a monastery is infused with love and prayer. And it always, even during the fasting times where we're just eating beans and rice and salad or whatever, it's the kingdom of heaven. It's the banquet feast of the Lord. It is so rich and life-giving. Now, of course, we've first partaken of the holy gifts of the mysteries of his body and blood, and that's our life. And the food then participates in that great feast. So even during fasting periods where the food is more uh, sparse or uh, more simplified, you still often feel, I come from the table still feeling like, that was so good. How can that be? Well, it's because it's the kingdom of heaven. And that's, that's how the kingdom of heaven tastes. And that's what it's like to eat at the table uh, in the Lord's house. So these are some of the things that one could expect going to a monastery, Maybe also, if there's time, and it depends how many visitors are there, but you might have time to talk with, with uh, the elder there, the, the abbot. That might happen where you have a spiritual conversation with him or somebody he's asked to, to do that. So I think, I think these are the kinds of things one could expect at, uh, with a pilgrimage to a monastery.